Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us um, tonight to explore another COVID-19 critical briefing uh, tonight on patient groups. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and to pay respects to elders both past and present. Declarations for tonight. Um, we're pleased to have the support of GlaxoSmithKline PLC with the educational content and speakers in the independently determined and selected by AMCO Proprietary Limited. I'd like to introduce now our chair, Dr. Gillian Farmer. Uh, Dr. Farmer is currently a general practitioner in Queensland. Her recent posts and experiences though um, are international in flavour and include a stint as medical director of the United Nations based at the headquarters of New York for eight years. Uh, during the time uh, that Gillian was in that post, she led the UN's internal response to Ebola and was also involved in responding to the first wave of COVID-19 in the US. Um, Gillian's also worked as a deputy director general in Queensland Health and in frontline clinician and primary care. So I'd like to hand over to you now, Gillian as chair, and I hope everyone enjoys the evening. Thanks very much, Ben, and it's great to be here with you again. And thanks so much to MJA for hosting these incredibly topical and important webinars. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that I think if those of you who are perhaps anything like me get a little bit of a pit in the stomach about what we might what might be coming um, over, over the years ahead as we start to learn more and more about COVID-19 and the post-acute phase. So tonight we're joined by two great experts and I'm very pleased in the first instance to introduce Professor Stephen Foe. Stephen's a rehabilitation physician and you get some sense of how old I am when you know I realise that when I graduated rehabilitation physician wasn't even a thing and it's the specialty for our time you know that ability to integrate all of that wonderful knowledge um, is going to be really critical for us in making balanced decisions about how we get people back on their feet. Um, he's the Director of the Department of Pain Medicine at St Vincent's Hospital and a Conjoint Professor of Medicine at the University of New South Wales. He's authored over 100 journal papers and I think has unparalleled expertise and in particular um, he was one of the people who had the get up and go to start one of the very first long COVID clinics in the country. Whilst other services and um, health bureaucracies were vacillating about whether it was even a thing or not, um, Stephen and the people at St Vincent's rolled their sleeves up and got going. So I'm absolutely delighted that he's able to join us tonight and I really look forward to hearing from him. Thank you, Stephen, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Gillian. And, um... Yeah, I don't know if um, uh, I rolled my sleeve up or I uh, made the wrong step, but we opened our first um, uh, first clinic. Um, and uh, I'm assuming you can hear me all right. So um, yes. first thing I wanted to do was just talk about the definition because that's quite complex and just the pathway to that definition. So it was first mentioned uh, on that uh, illustrious um, medical journal called Twitter um, in um, May 2020. Um, by a couple of doctors who later went on and published a, a journal article in the British Medical Journal. Um, that led to the British and the um, Americans writing up some guidelines and then the WHO followed. Um, and they had three goes at it, the WHO. The first one was what they called post-acute sequelae of COVID, which essentially was people who had had severe COVID and were still having symptoms after sort of um, six to eight weeks. Um, and then in 2021, they realised that uh, they needed to change that and they called it long COVID slash post-acute sequelae. And that was for people who actually had symptoms that kept going for more than three months. And then um, uh, in September of this year, they called it uh, the post-COVID-19 condition. And uh, I think I'll just move to the next slide. But just before I do that, or just now that I've done it, um, I wanted to tell you that they estimated that about 10 to 20 percent of people uh, were going to suffer from that. Now, the data's got better and better, and we know that about um, maybe about 10 percent of the Delta variants who were double vaccinated 
uh, did get long COVID and about 5% of the Omicrons who were triple vaccinated. So we're finding that there's let there, it's still a phenomenon, but there's perhaps less people as we get better and better at treating it and using antiretrovirals, et cetera. Um, so uh, just looking at the WHO definition, there are three things I wanted to draw your attention to. The first is probable or confirmed um, COVID uh, infections. Um, and um, one of the issues is that there are some people who, for a whole variety of reasons, couldn't be tested, but actually feel that they had COVID. And I wanted just to point out that if a person's had COVID within 300 days, there's a blood test that you can do to differentiate whether they've had long COVID, which is the nucleocapsid antibodies, or whether they've simply been vaccinated, which is where they have the spike antibodies. So there are ways of testing whether a person's actually had it. And I, I raise that because a couple of times in our clinic, we've had people who've actually had post-vaccination um, uh, sort of side effects who then got COVID. Um, and then don't know, but we've been able to identify um, as to who had a post-vaccination uh, syndrome versus those who people who had long COVID. The symptoms have to be present for two months um, at least, but, um, and, and here's the, probably the most important point, they can't be explained by an alternative, alternative diagnosis. And I'll talk a little bit about the complexity of that concept. Um, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is that, um, that you can have uh, the symptoms uh, from the beginning and they don't improve, or you can recover and then develop long COVID symptoms within those three, uh, three months. And so you can still have long COVID even though you recovered and then developed symptomatology within the three months. Um, slide. So um, there's, um, if you guys can just move, that's it, great, thank you. Um, the, uh, the other thing I want to tell you is that there are issues, of course, with a diagnosis of exclusion, particularly when you don't have clear paradigms about how to treat it. Um, and there's a beautiful paper, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that showed a whole handful of issues. One of them is um, the patients, and in many ways the doctors, have to live with uncertainty. And so the patients have to develop coping skills. Now, there are certain personality types and personality traits that have difficulty with coping with uncertainty, particularly those with obsessional traits or perfectionistic traits um, are gonna have a lot more trouble accepting the fact that they're not perfect and can't do their work. Um, then for the doctors, you know, the question is, do I watch um, or do I investigate? And that's a, uh, that's a tension between over-investigating and seeing how things go and also um, absorbing the pressure from an anxious patient about referring. Um, and there's, of course, medical complexities of a condition that can interact with other comorbidities. So the question is, um, am I just seeing a worsening of a pre-existing degenerative condition? And I put it to you that this is one of the reasons why a lot of very older, uh, you know, people, or older people in the geriatric population are not presenting with long COVID because they're actually having just a recrudescence of pre-existing uh, pre-morbid conditions like osteoarthritis. Um, and of course, um, there, you know, the complexities of people um, developing symptomatology who are unemployed or uh, where, um, you know, they've got a lot of socioeconomic stressors. And uh, the other thing is some people are just having a natural recovery but don't have a lot of functional reserve. So the older people, the ones who are at risk of falls, um, people with disabilities, and perhaps that's what you're seeing. So slide. Um, I'm talking about observations from a terrific uh, um, article by O'Hare where they looked at 260,000 veterans, of which about 4,000 had long COVID, and the veteran systems allow them to have a detailed look at their electronic health records. So they randomly selected 200 and put them in thematic sort of groups to give us a qualitative sort of um, uh, article. Um, they talked about the reliance on patient reports. That's the other thing about this condition that you're really, you're relying on patient report. There's no objective measures. Um, they talked about the fact that there would be a fair amount of care fragmentation because um, uh, some people get referred to coordinated clinics, which are multidisciplinary and, and that'll be terrific, but a lot of people don't have access to that because we work in silos. So you might, uh, somebody will come in and say, I've got chest pain, you'll refer them to a uh, cardiologist and they'll say, there's nothing to see here, the heart's okay, I've got no idea. And then the patient starts on a sort of merry-go-round of a whole variety of specialists and repeated tests. And then of course, in primary care, what you want is you want to say, this is a discrete entity, this is just 
long COVID, and therefore, um, you know, uh, I don't, I, I, I don't have the experience to manage that. So. Um, we're trying to develop people's skills in managing a condition with a whole variety of symptomatology. Slide. When uh, we originally published a, an early article on um, long COVID, we expected four waves. The first was people who were very sick and got it and went to ICU, um, and we saw that group. Um, the second group are those who didn't come to hospital because they were frightened about getting COVID, so they presented late with their strokes and late with their heart attacks, and they were much more severe, and we did see that group. Um, another group was... Um, those people who relied on outpatient services like pulmonary rehab or other services who couldn't get it because of COVID and then developed falls or infections and were admitted. And of course, the impact on people with mental health problems, uh, which continued. What we never expected was that we'd have a chronic form of this disease, which I think is what we're looking at now. Slide. Um, so who's at risk? Well, we do know that women and older people and middle-aged people are more at risk and those with two or more comorbidities, particularly diabetes, hypertension, um, mental health issues. What we've also seen is that people with persistently high CRPs seem to be, um, uh, it seems to be a marker of long COVID, not always, but it's there. And we're developing other markers as they develop, but I don't know what they are. I'll talk about one of them with to do with long COVID with the cognitive effects of COVID, but it's not available as yet. Clearly those with mechanical ventilation and ARDS who were in ICU and who developed post um, uh, intensive care syndrome or hypoxia from their long periods on, um, on uh, high flow oxygen um, or PTSD. And we found that um, those with uh, severe illness are more likely to suffer long COVID. Certainly the Delta group did. Um, but people with mild illness, particularly if they had multiple acute sin, uh, symptoms at the time, were also at risk. And there is some question about whether those in lower socioeconomic groups uh, are more likely to get it. Slide. So as you can see, the most common um, sort of symptoms are fatigue. Um, ground glass opacities in the lungs are very common, so I'm glad we've got Peter Walk, who's going to talk uh, in detail about that. Uh, shortness of breath insomnia, and then you get into difficulty walking, anxiety and depression, and then cognitive impairment. And you can see that, um, you know, fatigue is present in almost 40% in this study, uh, which was a group of systematic reviews. But even the cognitive impairment in this study was um, present in just under uh, 20%. So it's not, um, it's not without a whole myriad of symptoms. And at that point, I think I'm going to hand over to Peter to talk about the management of breathlessness. So thanks, thanks Peter. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, and look, that's that was terrific. Thank you very much for introducing the topic, particularly there, um, and really highlighting those key um, those key symptoms. So, as you can see, long COVID is a complex set of circumstances and set of problems with really quite varied um, presentations. Now, I'm I'm going to reduce it to the the simplest uh, or most common denominator, and really just focus on some of the areas of breathlessness, um, because that's pretty much what I know. Um, but you can see that that's, that's really only part of the issues that are present here. Um, so if we just start, I think, by introducing a case to focus on this to begin with. So, um, and I think you've got the case up now. Mr. RB is a 77 year old gentleman. Um, he's a retired pastor. Well, he was supposed to be retired, but as you do, um, he was running a refuge despite having retired as well. Um, unfortunately, there was an outbreak of COVID-19 in the refuge, and he, of course, came down with, with the infection. Um, he'd had a background history of some hypertension, type 2 diabetes. He had never smoked and didn't have any previous history of lung disease. <coughs> he had been vaccinated. This was um, in the middle of last year, and so he'd had two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine in July and August. He acquired Delta during the Delta outbreak in New South Wales, and in particular in Newcastle. Um, so the outbreak occurred. He wasn't terribly unwell to begin with. We didn't have access to antivirals and things like that then. But by day eight, his symptoms started to worsen. He had increasing cough, breathlessness, fever, and he presented to hospital. He was quite hypoxic initially on room air, uh, 
he was febrile. We immediately did some bloods and found that he had a very high CRP. He also was tachycardic. He had lymphopenia. He had a number of features that were very concerning. He immediately started on treatment, which became our standard at that time with intravenous remdesivir, oral dexamethasone and oral baricitinib. He required support for his breathing, though, and went fairly early on to being prone and then requiring CPAP with an FiO2 of up to 0.4. He had standard anticoagulation with anoxaparin for, for all of our patients with pneumonia, of course. So he proceeded on, he stabilized to some extent, um, and after six days of requiring CPAP and proning, we were able to step him down to nasal prongs. He was starting to get better and we were somewhat reassured as we were quite concerned and he certainly spent a number of days very unwell. But unfortunately, around day nine, he became breathless once again. He developed new atrial fibrillation. A few more investigations showed him to have a, a very positive D-dimer. His CRP was still declining at that time. His chest X-ray was arguably a little bit better rather than worse. And we went on and did a CTPA and confirmed that he had multiple subsegmental pulmonary emboli. Um, he was anticoagulated fully at that point and again, gradually settled over the next several weeks. He was still very breathless though, and he was still struggling to get home. And we were fortunate to have an in-reach rehabilitation program that took him and he had several weeks of, um, of inpatient rehabilitation. At the time he was discharged home though, he was by far not anywhere near his baseline. He was still quite breathless on, on um, mo mobilizing even just short distances. He was still hypoxic. And at that time, when we did a six minute walk test, he only managed about 205 meters, less than half of what would be predicted. And he's desaturated down to a nadir saturation of 86%, though his PaO2 sat around about 90 to 92% at rest. Next slide, please. Um, and by the time we got to see him back in clinic review, um, this was around 30 days afterwards. He was still complaining of a lot of breathlessness. He was mobilizing with a wheelie walker, and this was a man who was completely independent beforehand. He was quite breathless, and I'll draw your attention to the top right-hand corner of the slide. This is a, a little patient reported outcome or PROM called the dyspnea 12, but we, we use to really quantify breathlessness. Um, it doesn't matter so much what each of those questions there, but if you look against the red crosses, you can see that he, he scores in the moderate to severe range for a lot of these sorts of areas. And his overall score of 18 really indicates a very high impact upon his quality of life with fairly minimal breathlessness. He had some lung function tests that showed him to have nearly restrictive looking spirometry, but still within the normal limits. His vital capacity was sitting around about 80% of predicted. But when you do his gas transfer factor, that was impaired and was sitting around about 37%. Um, um, but when you corrected for volume, probably about two thirds of what it should be. And when he had a CT scan, you can see that he had findings consistent with some interstitial lung disease. Now, this was better than when he was in hospital, but still at day 32, he had some ground glass opacifications that you can see on the right-hand side, lower right-hand again. Um, the top set of scan results are from day 32, and then I've got some follow-up ones at day 198 that um, still show improvement, but how long these changes can last for. So some ground glass infiltrates, some areas of fibrosis and scarring. So quite extensive disease in keeping with his disease process. Next slide, please. And this was really his course of action throughout his time with us. So at discharge, really quite breathless, significant impact on his quality of life. The St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire measures this and a higher number measures a greater impact on quality of life. He was a bit hypoxic on room air, certainly worse than what he was pre-morbidly. He managed 205 meters on his six minute walk test. That's the distance you can walk in six minutes. And he had some desaturation during that time. 
Because he had persistent respiratory problems, persistent significant breathlessness, we referred him to pulmonary rehabilitation. At the commencement of that, he'd had some improvements, but you can still see quite breathless, a bit hypoxic, quite limited in terms of his exercise tolerance. By the end of pulmonary rehabilitation, he did feel better. This is an eight-week course with a graded exercise program and ongoing inpatient support, though some of his program was conducted remotely at the time. Um, you can see his breathlessness has started to improve. The dyspnea score falls down to 12. He's less hypoxic at rest, um, and he can walk further. So he's gone from 238 metres to 325 metres, which is a good response. His nadir saturations don't fall below 90% anymore, so he is gradually getting better, though that's probably not an effect of his pulmonary rehabilitation. He continued to do and re rehabilitate himself and to have a, a regular exercise program that he was assigned after discharge from the eight-week program itself. And you can see by the time I saw him and had that repeat CT scan done nearly 200 days later, he was better though probably not return to his baseline. So less breathless, better saturations, though not normal. He could manage 398 metres, which is about 80% predicted for his age, um, and he didn't desaturate nearly to the same extent. Next slide, please. So breathlessness is really quite common post-COVID-19. You saw from Stephen Sline of a deer study but it's at least the second or the third most common symptom of ongoing of problems. So how many people are still breathless a month after discharge? Well, this is a systematic review of around about 119 studies that looked at that. 35 papers looked at people who were exclusively hospitalised and 10 non-hospitalised individuals. They found around about 26% of patients complained of significant breathlessness one month after their acute COVID-19. Now, if you were still breathless at six months, though, then that was concerning because even at 12 months, you could see that prevalence rate only shifted down to 20%. Females were more likely to suffer with breathlessness at this point than males. Older age groups, so age greater than 50, was more likely to be associated with ongoing breathlessness and not surprisingly, people who had more severe acute disease were significantly more likely to complain of breathlessness. Next slide, please. And so if we think about this in the timeline that we're looking at in this post-COVID space, there are several different problems that could be emerging. You saw with Mr. RB several things that happened with him. Of course, within the first 30 days of infection, the most likely cause for breathlessness is the acute pneumonitis that people suffer. But this can also be complicated by bacterial pneumonia. And as you saw, pulmonary embolism was increased, particularly during the Delta pandemic phase. And of course, there are also some cardiac complications, most commonly ischemic heart disease, but also rarely viral myocarditis. Once people have moved beyond that first 30 days, you're looking at six to 12 weeks post-discharge, you still see a number of acute problems here. If you have severe disease, that typical post-ICU, acute, severely impaired individuals with a lot of respiratory disease, deconditioning, the group that should benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation feature very highly in this group. You've got a group who have now persistent interstitial changes that we hope will continue to improve, as Mr. RBs did. We have some individuals who go on to develop new forms of interstitial lung disease, such as organising pneumonia, though that's very rare, but it does occur. And of course, I mention again, the risk of cardiac ischemia and cardiac dysrhythmias, which are really very common, as you'll have seen in many of those veterans um, studies post COVID. And finally, when we're looking at that group post that three month period, we're seeing a slightly different change here. This is where we're moving into the group with more long COVID symptoms, a more complex sort of paradigm with these other features that, that we'll talk about in greater depth. But as some of these individuals are going to have more diffuse interstitial lung disease, and we fear may be left with permanent interstitial lung disease, which was seen in a cohort of individuals during the first SARS-CoV-1 pandemic. 
Um, so next slide, please. I'll just briefly touch upon the problems with pulmonary embolism. We see this as a, an acute complication during severe disease acutely, but it can also occur in that immediate phase. But as you see from this data, most of this is occurring within that 12-week phase. So this is a, a, a large observational study, over 2,000 individuals post-COVID-19, followed up for 90 days following discharge. Around about 1.3% developed venous thromboembolic events. A very small number also developed problems with arterial thrombosis, but you saw most of these being pulmonary emboli and DVT. Now, that was more likely in people who were more significantly unwell. It was more likely if people had a very hyperacute inflammatory response. Um, and it, of course, was prevented if people were discharged on anticoagulation. So very few people are. But you can see from the graphs there on the right-hand side that most of these events do occur within the first 60 days of discharge from hospital. Next slide, please. So persistent breathlessness beyond that three-month period starts to move into different areas, and we start to become concerned whether people might have significant interstitial lung disease. So it begs the question, how do we investigate them? Well, as you know, respiratory physicians like doing spirometry, and we weren't allowed to do a lot of it during COVID, so now is our chance to get back there. Well, spirometry alone might not give us a lot of answers here. So our gentleman had borderline restrictive physiology that you saw in his spirometry, but that really reflected the de degree of impairment that he had quite significantly. So spirometry alone is really not a very sensitive tool. But if you then go and look at things like gas transfer factor or DLCO, as you saw, this man had a fairly significant reduction in his DLCO. And that's a lot more sensitive, but more importantly, it correlates better with findings such as high resolution CT scans, which show ongoing ground glass change or interstitial change. Next slide, please. So when we look at this group, this is the post um, hospitalization COVID-19 cohort, we see a fairly complex group of individuals. Breathlessness features very highly here, but this is a group that the NHS followed up with 20 different NHS trusts. All patients admitted with COVID-19 were then followed from March to November, and this is the first 1,000 that were assessed six months after discharge. Now, this is probably quite different to the Australian experience that we're going to have, particularly given that this was occurring in a largely unvaccinated population, a lot of alpha and delta amongst these individuals, so a somewhat different time span. But you can see here a group of individuals with a lot of breathlessness, as you can see on the graphic on the, on the right-hand side there, against that other symptoms, and they've got increased cognitive impairment. And it, it really falls into these sorts of patterns where you've got a group with a very high level of physiological impairment, as well that relates very closely to the severe acute disease that may suffer with, and then a group with more complex fatigue, neurocognitive involvement, and that doesn't correlate quite so well with the respiratory physiological background that they've got. Next slide, please. So persistent breathlessness, how and what do we go looking for? Well, as I mentioned, there has been a great concern that a large proportion of these individuals, particularly with severe acute pneumonitis, will go on and develop a form of progressive pulmonary fibrosis, for which we already have very few treatments. Fortunately, this is probably only going to be a very small number of individuals. This is the UK ILD cohort. Now, this is a subgroup of that PHOSP cohort, that much larger cohort, which is being recorded there. And they went looking to see how they could pick up the presence of people with significant underlying persistent ILD or interstitial lung disease. So they looked at around about 3,000 individuals, 240 days post-discharge. They assessed them with spirometry, DLCO, and high-resolution CT scan. But what they wanted to know was whether the spirometry and the DLCO would predict the people who had a high level of breathlessness and had evidence that they had ongoing changes on CT. 
And they found that having a reduced DLCO and abnormal chest X-ray was a good predictor. Next slide, please. So when you go and look at these individuals to see why they are so breathless, we can do really fairly intense investigations, such as cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And when we do that, we find that while some of these individuals have significant interstitial lung disease, the vast majority have a much more complex picture. So this is a systematic review of 38 observational studies around about 2,000 adults, but each individual study was very, very small. They found that people who still complained of breathlessness at this point had at least a moderate reduction in their exercise tolerance, but that they did not find, next slide please, but most of them had evidence of significant cardiovascular or respiratory impairment. They did find other issues here that might relate to deconditioning, something that pulmonary rehabilitation would help for, but also features such as dysfunctional breathing and other fairly ill-defined sorts of problems. Next slide, please. This really just highlights the risk of cardiovascular disease that I highlighted earlier there. This is the US veteran study of 150,000 veterans followed up. And it really just shows the increased risk in these individuals that were hospitalized of atrial fibrillation, cardiac ischemia with myocardial infarction, and cardiac failure. Next slide, please. So what can be done for these individuals? Well, for those people who have a significant respiratory impairment and have significant deconditioning, a fairly small number of individuals, then pulmonary rehabilitation probably is helpful in terms of that breathlessness. There has been one randomized control trial and seven observational studies. The randomized control trial was a Chinese trial and it was relied upon tele-rehabilitation, but it found that traditional pulmonary rehabilitation did reduce breathlessness, did improve factors like six-minute walk test, and did improve quality of life, at least modestly. But it really only focused on that improvement in terms of breathlessness. The rest of the problem is obviously far more complex. And I'll hand back to Stephen to take it from there. Well, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, that was um, a very thorough look at the breathlessness. I wish um, there was the same level of um, research in this area. Um, I'll just take you to the next slide. One of the questions that a lot of people will have is, is this different to any other illness characterised by fatigue? Um, and the, um, the main concept is, yes, look, dyspnea is a hallmark and there are radiological changes and there are blood marker changes. So um, this makes it slightly different from other just fatigue-related diseases. Um, We've also had people in hospital with bed rest and uh, steroids, antiviral medications, and many of them have had their mental health affected. Um, uh, with respect, just on a bit of a positive note, um, in France, they looked at 35,000 people who had had COVID and asked them for symptoms, and 89.9% .9 had no symptoms at two years. So we are looking at a small percentage. But if we compare... Um, uh, compare it with other coronavirus illnesses such as SARS, we found that fatigue persisted for up to four years, particularly in women um, and those using steroids. Um, they had particular uh, predilection for fatigue and weakness. There were ongoing lung diffusion abnormalities when SARS for up to 12 months. And if we look at MERS, which is uh, another coronavirus disease, we found that there were persistent lung changes for 12 months. Now, um, did it go on for longer? We're not sure because the study's finished at that time. Um, slide. So the question is, um, uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a um, uh, validated and reliable tool for the measurement of a variety of symptoms associated with um, uh, long COVID. And this is the Yorkshire Long COVID Questionnaire, which is available in New South Wales at the HOPE platform, which is New South Wales Health pro, uh, Platform. But if you simply Google um, uh, the Yorkshire uh, 
long COVID questionnaire, you'll find this questionnaire available as well as a, an app version of it. Um, and in this way, you can measure and you are, it's a patient reported measure, so you don't have to do anything, just give it to the patient in the waiting room or after, and they will measure the level of symptoms that they have, and you can use it to follow up their improvements or, or not. Slide. So um, how are you going to, uh, particularly in general practice or in the community, how are you going to set up a multidisciplinary rehab program? Well, the first thing is you need to assemble a team of um, allied health professionals, and that'll vary from area to area and <coughs> resources. So you might find that um, you've got a really good physio and a good OT in one area, or you might find you've got a good psychologist and an OT. So you have to assemble those people. And then you have to, uh, particularly for GPs, or you can, have an initial case conference. There is a uh, GP item number for that. And Allied Health um, have been able to attend with a rebate from uh, Medicare as well to those case conferences. And in those um, initial case conferences, you need to set the goals, ideally with the patient, but if often you can't. So you set goals and, um, and you work out how long that would need to take. Now, in general practice, you have the ability to um, activate a mental health management plan or a, an extended care plan so that they can um, uh, access psychological services or um, allied health services um, with some Medicare support. And for those of you who, um, who need to advise their patients if there would be additional uh, costs, you need to do that. Um, then I guess you need a review case conference in about six to eight weeks to see if you've achieved the goals that you've been trying to. And, uh, and you need to review the patient at 12 weeks to say that you've completed the program and you've assisted them in their goals. It might be return to work or return to driving or just return to looking after the family or, or gardening or whatever it is that they want. So a slide. Um, in New South Wales, there's um, uh, guidelines for the management of long COVID, and um, there are also um, uh, uh, information in the general practice health pathways, and that's available all through the country. And it indicates how you can set up uh, rehabilitation programs in the community, but also when you can refer to rehab services and where they might be. Um, slide. So uh, what's an overall plan? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to give advice on uh, further testing, vaccination and cardiovascular risk. We know that for the first year uh, after COVID, there's going to be a heightened cardiovascular risk. So you need to make sure that um, you're keeping um, the uh, risk factors such as, uh, um, uh, such as hypertension and uh, uh, lipids within their normal level. Um, you need to measure all the symptoms at the start. And there's a whole variety of um, measures that you can use. Um, and your allied health people will give you some measures that they'd be happy with. Um, you need to develop a plan for treatment. So for the physiotherapist, you need to develop a, a movement program. So you'll ask the physiotherapist to gently advise them on uh, increasing their levels of movement and activity. The psychologist, you might ask them to give the patient advice on pacing their activities. Um, if there's an occupational therapist, you might get them to talk to the workplace um, and uh, prepare the workplace for a graduated return to work. And there are a number of outcome measures, such as the Borg scale for uh, breathlessness um, and uh, the Yorkshire, which I've just showed you, and a fatigue severity scale. So you need to think about those scales and get them um, uh, operating from the very beginning um, slide. So... At this point, the patient's going to ask, what's wrong with me? And there's a whole variety of theorised mechanisms. There's likely to be many. Um, one of the most um, interesting ones is the, um, the fact that um, there's ongoing immune activity going, uh, going on. And this has been found um, in vitro where the virus um, gets into monocytes and macrophages. And instead of just replicating and then bursting the cell open with uh, uh, replica, uh, replications of the virus, what they do is they get into the cells, they start to replicate, and then they abort their own replication. And they paralyze the cell so that its usual job of uh, producing cytokines and attracting other uh, immune cells to get rid of the virus is um, defunct. So what happens is in these situations, you see ongoing CRP because you've got virus infecting and you've got ongoing immune activity, but it's paralyzed and slow.
A second mechanism which is quite well described overseas is the microclot or hypercoagulability um, um, sort of theory where um, apheresis, which is the cleaning of the blood and uh, the, the uh, filtering out of fibrinogen and plasminogen has been noted to be increased. And, um, uh, and so it was thought that people are going to be having small fibrin clots in a whole variety of organs, including the brain and the lungs um, and, uh, and uh, even um, uh, you know, other uh, organs such as the liver. Um, and um, this was um, a number of studies in, the, uh, in Europe uh, used apheresis uh, and cleaned the blood of this and then hoped the patient would return to normal. Now, they did actually get some improvement from the very first apheresis, but no further improvements thereafter. Um, and there were there been studies with uh, triple um, coagulation, um, aspirin um, and uh, a NOAC and clopidogrel, um, but there's been no really good outcomes. And then um, the another theoretical concept is that there's a slow resetting of the immune system. We're seeing that because of ongoing secretion of mRNA um, in the stool. And the theory is that the immune system is um, still working and having a bit of a, a longer time to um, get back to its standard uh, management um, system. So um, these are some of the explanations we've been giving patients. I'm sure there'll be likely to be many more as we get more information on the physiology or pathophysiology of the condition slide. So let's look at a symptom such as fatigue and, and talk about how to approach it. Well, the first thing is it's important to exclude mental health issues such as depression and anxiety and be treating them with cognitive behavioral therapy or, um, uh, or drug therapy. Um, and then uh, you need to sort of develop a, um, an activity or movement program, starting uh, with very, very simple movements and increasing very, very gently, um, using good feedback with the patient to make sure you're not overdoing it. You need to have a medication review. So there, if they're on medications that would cause fatigue, they're minimized. Um, if they have neuropathic pain, um, particularly um, uh, and pain in other areas, such as pericardial pain or chest pain, that needs to be managed. Um, and um, of course, other comorbidities need to be managed. And then you get some interdisciplinary um, therapies, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, um, as well as um, exercise uh, under the guise of a uh, with a physiotherapist to manage sort of hyperventilation or dysfunctional breathing during exercise, which is what Peter mentioned. And you need a lot of psychoeducation because a lot of people become fearful of exercise and then don't want to exercise, become anxious. A, beha <laughs> a behavioral program is often required to minimize bed rest. And I'll show you a, a, a case a study where bed rest became a bit of an issue, sometimes a nutritional review, and then discussion about return to work and driving will often um, help people uh, to develop sort of optimism about their recovery. Um, next slide. Um, now, this is quite an important controversial area um, about uh, what we call um, uh, post-exertional malaise. Now, uh, the people who suffered with chronic fatigue syndrome described a lot of post-exertional malaise. And so the NICE guidelines, the UK guidelines, recognise post-exertional malaise. But the research uh, into its development was quite flawed and, and uh, very minimal. Um, and uh, what they identified that, that uh, people who had post-exertional malaise often had conflict with their physiotherapists and uh, needed to um, have uh, be given regular feedback uh, to the therapists about how they're progressing. And I think that is a lesson that we're learning in the management of this fatigue is that we need to get a lot of feedback. Um, and um, so the term graded exercise program was what people used in chronic fatigue. And I think um, often that um, is um, triggers a sort of thought process in physiotherapists and exercise physiologists that might make them push people a bit uh, faster without getting appropriate feedback. So a graded or um, so a, a sort of tailored exercise or activity program will prevent this sort of push and crash cycle. So what often happens is you slow down their exercise, patient feels 
quite confident. They go back to work and then they uh, feel that they can't work and they crash and go to bed and then become deconditioned and the cycle begins again. So this is um, an important um, sort of thing to discuss with a physio or an exercise physiologist to make sure that they understand that. So slide. I now wanted to talk a little bit about uh, cognitive impairment because, again, this is something that you'll see a fair bit of. And I wanted to talk about the ADAPT study uh, by Sisek et al. at um, St. Vincent's. We were lucky early on to enrol a whole variety of patients and get to follow them with blood tests and, um, and physiological markers as well as um, uh, as well as cognitive markers and uh, clinical markers. And we found that cognitive impairment um, occurred in about 26% and was independent of admission to ICU, which was very interesting because we thought the more severe you, you got the disease, the more likely you were to have cognitive impairment. We found that there was a high percentage in not the severe cases, but uh, in the mild to moderate cases. Um, we did MRIs and we found that... Um, there were 19 out of, um, uh, out of these patients had a variety of um, changes in the hippocampine insula, um, which we, could, we, could, we call them unidentified bright objects, but they're essentially uh, indications of abnormalities. And these people had smell and uh, taste abnormalities. And we found that disease severity, mental health issues or medical comorbidities were not really relevant. We also found a marker, which is quinolinic acid, which seemed to be higher in those people with cognitive impairment. Um, and uh, we're developing further research so that that could perhaps be a marker slide. Um, <clears throat> um, some recent research shows that issues are emerging, but unfortunately the answers are, are not. So cognitive loss seems to follow the reporting of symptoms, so that seems to be um, um, quite accurate. Um, it correlates um, with poor uh, quality of life. And um, we found that uh, people uh, in, in Wuhan um, uh, seem to um, all, uh, even the people with um, mild disease showed cognitive impairment early, but recovered. Well, as those in the UK, they seem to, uh, a lot of people uh, reported cognitive impairment for up to 150 days. And the cognitive impairment seemed to worsen with the pulmonary dysfunction. Um, slide. So testing for long COVID uh, involves the standard sort of cognitive testing that we all do. This includes um, looking at attention and uh, working memory, uh, new learning, speed of information processing, because you'll notice that people are a bit slower, and uh, some of their executive functioning skills. Um, and uh, it'd be, it's always good to ask them about the taste and smell. Uh, slide. Um, so uh, what are the treatments for long COVID? Well, essentially, they're, um, they're rehabilitation um, uh, treatments to improve uh, function. So um, we uh, do some exercise, which uh, does uh, improve people. Uh, we work on um, what they can do with their memory rather than what they can't do and ask them to maximize that. We treat any anxiety and depression. And um, we um, uh, will often... Um, try and individualize um, the treatment so that the OT will speak to the workplace and see what um, activities are required in their job and focus what cognitive um, uh, strengths they have to those activities. So it's quite an iterative process slide. Um, so uh, we assess patients' function, which you'll have to do in your practice. We can use mockers or the ACR or mini mental states, exclude the causes uh, of any other causes, including medication. Um, manage any mental health issues. And we talk about um, uh, getting the occupational therapist involved in their return to work and return to driving. The physio needs to get involved in activity and we get psych uh, psychologists um, to uh, monitor their cognitive impairment. An OT can do that as well. Um, and using, psych uh, using a dietitian just to get, make sure that they've got a reasonably good uh, um, uh, nutrition. And you'll see that in New South Wales, we've developed a sort of guide in how to manage that. And that's been available on um, uh, through the Health Pathways slide. So um, there's a number of documents which I'll talk about later on, but that's available on the New South Wales Health, Health, Health website. But there's a lot of other, of a, a lot of other programs and uh, 
guidelines available in, um, uh, in um, health departments of other states. I'll just come to our final case study because I can see the time's ticking on. Uh, next slide. So this is a case um, who came a few months ago to me, a 57-year-old man who attended a work uh, uh, activity, a trade show, and um, got COVID. Now, I, I mentioned this because... Um, because in this matter, it became a workers' compensation matter. And we're seeing quite a lot of workers' compensation matters, particularly amongst teachers who are forced to go to uh, teach and uh, to work when children couldn't be inoculated and got COVID there. So um, he was PCR positive. He had a lot of um, acute factors, felt a bit depersonalised, and he had quite a productive cough. So he had some augmentin. He had a couple of weeks off and then a gradual return to work. But when he got to six hours, uh, five days of work, he was unable to continue because of fatigue, whole body pain and tremor, and he essentially went to bed to, 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 for two weeks. And just prior to that, he'd lost his way to find a, a client that he normally visits. Um, he'd lost his house keys a couple of times, and he was noticed at work to be underperforming, which was unusual for him. He'd had a past history of hypertension, um, but interestingly, he had a push bike accident with a um, complicated by PTSD, and this was settled with a psychologist. And when we had a look at his um, work life, he appeared to be the very common phenotype that we're seeing in our clinic, which is he was very hard working, 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, he um, also exercised quite a bit, 60 to 80 minutes a day with his partner. And what we're seeing is in that cohort, uh, being slowed down by the fatigue associated with COVID um, doesn't really match their lifestyle slide. On examination, he had a, a, a lower mocha than you'd expect, not terrible. Um, he had difficulty with repetitive sit to stands. Um, we noticed that he had a, um, a sort of uh, a cubital fossa syndrome, which I think was a red herring. Um, his CIP and D dimer were normal, um, uh, but we thought he looked, he had long COVID, he had um, a, a left um, ulnar neuropathy, he was deconditioned, and we thought he had an adjustment disorder with panic. And on one occasion, he uh, couldn't find his way home and called his family from a nearby park and uh, was found to be tremulous in the park. So it was clear that he'd have a, a panic attack on his own in, in a park with cognitive impairment slide. So the rehabilitation plan was to use uh, an SNRI for both nerve pain, because he was getting whole body pain, and for panic. Um, um, and um, we were going to repeat his mocha after three weeks of that. We commenced him on um, outpatient rehabilitation, which was easier because he had a workers' compensation claim, so he's able to have private treatment and an individualised exercise program. He had psychological treatment for both anxiety and pacing, and uh, there was contact with his workplace about his slow return to work, and, um, and uh, an occupational therapist went and fixed his workstation slide. So, so far, he's on Cymbalta 90, and it's improved his pain by 50%, and he reports coping better. His walking program is now up to 20 minutes a day. Uh, we've slowed down his return to work, so he's not planning to return to work till January. He's had an occupational therapy worksite visit. He started outpatient rehabilitation, and his fatigue persists till midday, but he reports feeling stronger in the afternoon. And we're awaiting report of his cognition. And I don't know whether this means his cognition is good or bad, but he sent me a Christmas card. So uh, things must be working. Um, so finally, uh, next slide. Um, there's information available on uh, clinical guidelines in a number of states, Victoria, um, South Australia, um, Queensland. Um, some are coming in Western Australia and Tasmania. Slide. We have a number of documents that both uh, Peter and I have worked on uh, on the New South Wales website to um, give people advice on how to manage um, a long COVID in the community. And we've also uh, delivered information to the Health Pathways, which is available for general practitioners. Um, slide. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge some help from um, uh, Louise Sellers from the, uh, um, the Agency for Clinical Innovation. And I want to do a call out to tell you that uh, um, for the first time, Australia will host the International Rehabilitation Society for a Congress in uh, 2024. And thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I, I wish uh, that you have a much better evening than listening to me. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
I think you're on mute, uh, Gillian. Gillian. Clicked to me. Thanks very much, Stephen. That was fantastic and got some good comments coming in. Um, but to, to those of you who have joined us tonight, thank you for being here. And we do have a little bit of time left over to um, ask and answer questions. If you wish to direct your questions specifically to one of the two presenters, please just indicate. Otherwise, I'll make my best guess and sometimes hedge my bet. So the first question that I have um, in was a thank you for the excellent description of pathologies. So Stephen, I think this one might be yours, um, but Peter, you can chip in as well. The question is, have these pathological changes been observed to occur or are they likely to occur with any other viral infections? Great question. I'm afraid I don't know. The, the um, stuff I quoted was only coronavirus. Um, Peter, you might you might have a view on this. Yeah, look, it's a it's a really interesting question, and I suspect something that we've never thought long enough and hard enough about. Um, the the outcome of the first SARS CoV one pandemic, while only very small numbers, some of the survivors from that had just horrendous um, outcomes. Very very, it was a very severe acute illness, but but many of them had very significant residual problems. Um, you have to go back, and, and most of the time we've, we've had very mild pandemics in recent memory. So the, the, the swine flu outbreak was, was, was pretty, pretty minor compared to what we've recently experienced. But if you stretch back to the earlier pandemics, the 1918-1919 the, the flu, there were some very interesting discussions about long-term sequelae of infection, mm. Um, even neurological complications such as um, um, uh, 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 um, uh, oh, I've forgotten, uh, lethargica, um, uh, yeah, myalgia, that is in, myalgia lethargica, yeah, which, which had, has certainly happened. This is an area that we've never spent enough time on or thought enough about, I don't think. I must say that rehabilitation medicine started uh, following the polio epidemic and the TB epidemic because uh, we noticed that there were there were long term effects. Um, interestingly, polio didn't show the late changes of polio for up to twenty to thirty years. So um, it's uh, really an emerging area, but um, it's clear that the chronic end of infections haven't, as Peter said, has not been well um, accommodated for. And and I think that. You know, one of the takeaway messages that I'm getting from this is that we do need to be continuing to encourage people to avoid infection if possible, to not be cavalier about it's just mild or it's just like a cold, but to continue to exercise all reasonable precautions to avoid infection because we don't know what those out years hold. That's the big $64 million question. I, mean, um, I do have another, I have a comment from one of the participants here. Um, expressing a little concern that that we um, there is a conflation with post exertional malaise and mental health issues, and I um, so Stephen, do you wish to comment on that? I think I think I'll, I'll be walking through Tiger Country. Um, the, it's uh, it's fairly um, political, I think, um, because a lot of people with post exertional uh, malaise feel that this is a physical element. Um, however. Any sort of serious uh, health condition will cause, um, uh, you know, um, subsequent um, mental health issues like anxiety or health anxiety. So I think it's very hard to to really comment. Um, but um, uh, I think um, it's important to um, see it as both physical and and perhaps causing. Um, psychological mm -hmm. um, sequelae. And just on what Gillian said about um, preventing vac uh, preventing um, uh, the uh, catching or, uh, you know, catching or uh, getting COVID, the vaccination is important, but also the use of antiretrovirals within the first mm -hmm. five days. It's really important. Um, we think it decreases long, uh, the incidence of long COVID because it decreases severe infection. So I would I'd definitely recommend it for people with one risk factor. And that's an, I mean, the, the great news, and I, I don't know if everybody is aware of this yet, but um, the antivirals have been added to the prescriber bag supply so that those of you who are providing um, services in areas where pharmacy access can be tricky, you can have a little stockpile of antivirals available for your patients to get them going within that time frame. It's, it's really very frustrating when you see a patient who's at day six or day seven 
post onset. Um, earlier is better, and the early studies, as we learned in last last week's or for the last webinar, the early studies actually started the antivirals within three days. So um, starting them as early as possible is really important. Um, I'm just looking to see, um, we've got another question here. Thoughts um, on the recent observational hypothesis that long COVID is related to CNS microvascular disease and inflammation. Stephen, that one I think has got, is for you. Yeah, well, I mean, um, we, we think that might be true because of the um, uh, MRI images that we saw. Um, what to do about it is, is a real question. Um, with some of the um, uh, the changes in neurotransmitters, particularly this quinolonic acid, quinolinic acid, there is a target because there are some um, medications being used currently in MS that can target that pathway. So um, what we need is we need research in this area to start examining all of that. Um, I, uh, I can tell you that I don't think there is evidence that apheresis, which is washing the blood out of fibrinogen and uh, and plasminogen actually will prevent those um, clots, but we we really we really at a very embryonic phase. Um, another question now about the possibility, and I'm just scanning and trying to get as broad a sampling as I can because we're a little short of time. Um, but I've got a question here about people with ongoing breathlessness not due to lung pathology. So, um, Stephen, this may be you, but it's, a, it's, um, it's not due to lung pathology. But what about those who did not need to go to hospital but do not take antivirals and develop ground glass <coughs> changes and have persistent breathlessness? They obviously do not have deconditioning and will so will not respond to rehab. What's the usual prognosis for these patients? with persistent symptoms after three months? Well, that's over to you, Peter. Um, well, I mean, the short answer is that people who've got more severe acute disease tend to have more changes, including ground glass opacities and, and those sorts of changes. Um, they, they tend to have physiological impairment that might not be reflected well in spirometry, but it is reflected in things like their gas transfer factor. So if you do have significant parenchymal lung disease and you your exercise impairment will be limited under those circumstances because of that and if it's not then there are other factors that are that are, that are making you breathless so from that perspective i think it's really important to try and work out if someone has significant breathlessness what's going on um, the resolving ground glass opacification the problem is ct scans are very very sensitive that correlate relatively poorer in a uh, poorly to um, to symptoms, and and that's where the difficulty arises. You do lots of CT scans on people during the acute phase, and you'll see lots of abnormalities, most of which are of little to no consequence. Um, there are some complex sort of things emerging, such as microperfusion defects in small numbers of individuals out there for which um, lung scintigraphy might be a better investigation. But this is all pretty experimental stuff and, and people have to be fairly, the, the problem needs to be well defined. So mm. if you've got significant breathlessness, investigate and see what's going on. In, in our long COVID clinic, we have also, and I'd be interested to hear Peter's Remark, we've also seen a recrudescence of asthma, um, even childhood asthma. So um, people have been getting breathless and then um, their spirometry changes or their lung function changes. We, uh, and we've uh, our respiratory physicians have been giving them a variety of um, puffers with good effect. Um, and also we've seen dysfunctional um, breathing. Interestingly, in a handful of adolescents, which is um, not an insignificant number of people with long COVID, um, we've found that um, just training them um, in the gym with a, with a, um, uh, a physio to try and uh, stop them from focusing on their breathing and allow it to be more automatic uh, has been helpful too. So there's a few other, um, a few other um, avenues for treatment. So I'll so, throw yeah, one I mean, last question in, which is um, just for clarification, I think this was covered, but um, there's a, a GP colleague here who says they're seeing patients fitting a few of the symptoms, but with no respiratory symptoms. So is there a subset of long COVID that are respiratory fine, but are getting other symptoms? 
Yes, yeah. and that's an affirmative from... Yeah, well, what we did, what, when Peter and I worked together on this, we divided the phenotypes into pulmonary symptoms and pulmonary plus. So um, indicating there were people who had pulmonary symptoms that need to see a respiratory physician, which is why they're critically important in long COVID management. And then there are a group of people who might have some minor uh, respiratory symptoms or no respiratory symptoms, but cognitive um, uh, uh, fatigue, uh, exercise problems that need to be managed with multidisciplinary rehab. And is there um, any worse probability of long COVID on recurrent infection? It's difficult to say, but there certainly have been reports, um, case reports of people the second time round having very significant protracted symptoms. So yeah. there's some concern out there, but I, I can't say I've seen any any large prevalence studies that confirm that? I, I don't know if you have, Steve. Well, no, but we, we have seen people who had long COVID. I've seen three or four, this is anecdotal, just through our clinic, who then got a second dose and did not get long COVID symptomatology from the second dose. And I think um, it's it may well be related to the strain, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that some strains and some individuals will um, have long COVID symptoms, whereas they might be able to get away with it if they're being vaccinated or this second strain is, doesn't affect them quite as badly. Thank you very much. I am going to wrap things up now and apologise if I didn't get to your question. I did my best to skip around a broad swathe of topics. And thank you very much to both of our presenters. Really fascinating. There's been some great comments flowing in, um, wonderful detail, great expertise and incredibly topical and pithy for our times. And thanks also to MJA for providing us this incredibly timely opportunity to stop and reflect a little and hopefully improve our patient care as we all strive to do every single day. So thanks everybody. And um, as we are approaching the holiday season, I'll wish you all um, a restful holiday season, hopefully free of super spreader events and uh, stay well and we hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thanks, Julianne.